Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex. Alex, please tell where you're from and ask your question. Hi, doctor. This is Alex from California. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I have a question. If you had a patient that uh, made a calcium score a few years ago and get, you know, um, bad result like at the 200, 300 number, and he changed his lifestyle, moved to a plant-based diet, exercise, do everything based on the recommendation, everything the right way, uh, would you recommend him to take another calcium score to check if the if the risk been reduced or the 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 situation been improved or would you recommend to do any other type of test just to check if the situation become better than the previous test thank you so um so you didn't uh, you didn't mention spending much time in great britain <laughs> which would have made it an easier answer uh, because the uh, the National Institute, they call it NICE, uh, has come down on uh, the side of using coronary CT angiography. It is not adopted at that widespread sort of net. And in fact, it's we really argue to get it paid for. Medicare pays for it. But a lot of the insurance companies want to restrict the use of CT angiography. It's basically like a cardiac catheterization without the catheterization. You get the pictures of the artery. It's better than a cardiac catheterization in that the x-ray dye is the same, but the x-rays are not. That is, when you get a coronary angiogram, uh, you basically are seeing what's on the inside of the artery, and you can see, oh, there's a 90% narrowing in your proximal left anterior descending, the widow maker, this is so, you know, you can see that, but you don't see anything about the plaque itself, as opposed to a CT angiogram, you actually can characterize, is it fatty plaque? Is it fibro fatty, which means it's starting to heal up a little bit? Is it fibrous, which means it's pretty much stable? Is it fibrocalcific, meaning it's starting to harden? Uh, or is it calcific, which is, it's really stable. It's rock hard, literally rock hard, okay? <laughs> well, it turns out that calcified plaque does not give you heart attacks. Or, or if it's in a carotid, it's not going to break off and give you a stroke. It's the unstable plaque, which the which is the fibry, fib, uh, the fatty, and maybe fibro fatty. So the, this is the vulnerable plaque that you want to get rid of. So when you say you've done everything well, we're hopefully talking about a whole food plant based diet and statin or whatever you can do to lower both inflammation and cholesterol, so that you start reabsorbing the LDL out of the plaque, okay? And everybody has seen Dean Ornish's stuff on plaque regression, the Caldwell Esselstyn stuff. There's also, it's, it's uh, Ornish, Esselstyn, um, high dose um, resuvastatin, high dose atorvastatin, and evolocumab. There's five things that are out there on the market that can be done to reduce plaque. And you're not reducing the calcified plaque. If anything, the calcified plaque goes up Okay, that is why, because you're taking dangerous plaque that can give you a heart attack and turning it into rock hard plaque that will never give you a heart attack. And so some of it absorbs, some of it heals. Healing is, you know, getting the, the calcium deposits. So that kind of answers your question. That is, if you have a calcium score of 200, you're already in, in the area where you should be on um, what we call antiplatelet therapy. Uh, classically was aspirin. It may not be the best. The more recent trial, which was presented, but not uh, a full publication yet. So I, I can quote it and you can look it up. It's called the Panther trial that says that uh, when we were always a person with a heart attack gets two, two antiplatelet drugs, aspirin, and then something else, typically clopidogrel, that's a trade name Plavix or Berlinta or Prasigrel, one of those, one of those three. And then at, at, over time, depending on what their situation was with a heart attack, it would be at 12 months, you would drop the others and keep the aspirin at low dose. Well, it turns out the Panther trial says we had it wrong, that aspirin gives more intracranial bleeding and more heart, uh, more GI bleeding. And so we should be using the others. They're more, a little more expensive, but not that much more, uh, not like a GI bleed expensive. So, so any, whatever the, whatever the antiplatelet therapy is, that your doctor chooses. That's what 
you should be on plus a statin unless you can get that ldl down other ways and still this and you'd have to be lowering your, both your uh c-reactive protein and your ldl uh to to get the effect that you want and so that's usually done um uh, anything with a calcium score greater than 100 we recommend uh, the statin and the aspirin or anaplatelet therapy if it's below 100 not worth the aspirin we need to go back and look at the others and say maybe it is worth doing those but we don't have the data uh and if it's, it's calcium score of zero even if you have like a 25 or 30 percent risk and some people do you know have a a, a a calcium score that's zero with ridiculously high risk factors if you're one of those people you don't need either so um, just just to clarify, because uh, he asked um, about getting a second calcium score test to see where he's at. Do, right. would that, does that calcium score ever um, would that ever get lower, or is that once you have a calcium score at a certain rate that and it's and the calcium has has hardened, it's going to stay that way regardless of of what you do? Thanks, thanks. You called me out. That is, I gave such a long, detailed explanation that the answer probably got it. <laughs> what I was saying there is that number one. The calcium is your friend. Mm -hmm. okay? That's the you, that's your goal is to get it all to calcify, and so the best way to get uh, it to calcify is a statin. Okay, so you put people on statin, their calcium score goes up. Now, you could also see the score go up when the disease is getting worse. Okay, so the cal so that's telling you that doing a second scan is really not helpful. The time when it's helpful is when it's zero and a person is at risk, repeating it at five to 10 years, or if it's less than 100, because we're still not recommending antiplatelet drugs less for less than 100, such as aspirin. Uh, and so repeating that one in five years uh, would be a good idea to see if you're now above the threshold where it changes you from statin only to statin plus aspirin or whatever the antiplatelet drug is for the next generation. Great. Thank you for that clarification. So, um, you know, a lot of people in this audience are eating whole food plant-based uh, um, diets and are exercising and um, maintaining a healthy weight. Do those people need to be concerned with going and getting these various tests if they've been doing this for a while and they feel good? Um, is that something that they should be looking into getting these various tests or um, are they are they pretty much doing the right thing and therefore don't need to um, to worry about, um, you know, to be so proactive, I guess, in getting these tests with regard to heart disease and stroke for that matter? So as as you know, what I'm going to say, you know, so why is this guy picking up his phone? Because I got to show you this. Okay, <laughs> that on the screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the American College of Cardiology A calculator. So you saw that on my slide with the African-American church, that 19% decrease in their overall risk. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is how you do it. Everyone should have this on their phone. So every time, you know, this is Mother's Day. Somebody's going to have a dinner. You'll see Uncle Joe. <laughs> Uncle Joe, how old are you? Okay. So you're male and you're Caucasian. And uh, what was your last blood pressure? And what is what was your last cholesterol? Just give me a ballpark. And do you remember your HDL and your LDL? And you're not a diabetic and you quit smoking, oh, 10 years ago. And you put all that stuff in there. And it'll tell you the 10 year risk of having heart attack, stroke, or death. Okay. That should tell you whether or not you need all these tests. And that is if a person has a zero coronary calcium score, um, I was, um, then they don't need the therapy that the recommendations otherwise would, would say. Uh, if you have a risk of less than 5%, 10 year risk, you don't need a test. If you're b uh, between 5 and 7.5, there's a whole bunch of things, like 14 different things. Do you have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, any chronic kidney disease, any family history of somebody dying of heart disease be below age 60, premature coronary disease, any inflammation, and that you can measure that with your C-reactive protein. Do you have one of those fancy lipid tests that says that you have an elevated LP little a, uh, or anything that would be genetically putting you in at more risk than the usual population? Then at 5%, you start doing the coronary calcium test. If you don't have one of those many things I just mentioned, uh, which most people don't, then at 7.5%, you start to say, you know, you really should have this test. If you get above 20%, you might want the test out of curiosity, but even if it's negative, 
uh, you still worry. Why? Because there is such a thing, as we've been talking about, as non-calcified plaque. So there are people that that test a zero calcium score isn't perfect. It's darn good. Um, and, you know, they call it the power of zero, but the power of zero isn't cardiac immortality for the next 10 years. It's just extremely, extremely low risk, like six events out of a thousand. So it was 0.06% or 0.6%. That's pretty low, but it's not zero. And, and where can we find that calculator? Oh, just, just put it in your search engine. You can find it immediately. So ACC risk calculator. Um, the official name is a little harder for people. 100% of people get it wrong when I say it out loud. Uh, and so ASCVD, and then they'll say, what? 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 <laughs> so those five letters, ASCVD, that stands for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Okay. But if you put in there ASCVD risk, it'll pop up. All right, perfect. It's free. perfect. Thank you. And um, do higher levels of cholesterol lead to higher levels of heart attacks and strokes? And um, what do we do uh, if your cholesterol level is high, um, but you already eat a whole food plant-based diet? So we're talking about the genetics. And as I mentioned before, we we're talking to, so um, the person putting that in probably was right before I put made the comment about lifelong exposure to LDL cholesterol. So yes, having a high cholesterol. And it's so funny, as um, a, a friend of mine showed me an article, um, I think it was in AARP or something, you know, that said, oh, the cholesterol myth that, you know, people are saying that elevated cholesterol is, is bad and it's not true. Well, and then when you read their bullet points, they were all proving the opposite. That is, they were saying your total cholesterol is not important. That is true. It's your LDL cholesterol. And they're saying, but the LDL isn't as important as people say it is. It's, it's your small, dense LDL. That is true. Everything they said is true, which meant that that whole title of cholesterol not being important was completely misleading <laughs> because all the data they were talking about uh, was was emphasizing the importance of having a low uh, LDL, particularly small dense LDL. How do you do that? Get rid of your triglycerides. Okay, how do you get rid of triglycerides? A whole food plant based diet plus exercise. And you're you know if your triglyceride level is double digits, your LDL is less dangerous. Okay. So uh, people can actually benefit from lifestyle more than they think uh, if they can get the LDL down and, uh, and protect themselves from uh, the uh, real dense LDL. There are people genetically who have a high LP little a, have to been mentioned that. It's a significant portion of the population, a good 10%. And um, if you have one of those genes that makes a high LP little a, then you really should uh, realize that you are at more risk than even the risk calculator uh, will tell you. Um, uh, and so you take that risk seriously if you have uh, LP little a. People will tell you that uh, it doesn't respond to diet because it's completely genetic, um, but you, if people who saw that slide, you know, five-week intervention in, in our African-American community, LP little a dropped, just like everything else dropped.